Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today. My name is Cristina Stefanelli. I'm project manager at UNIMED, the Mediterranean Universities Union. Today's webinar is about the Marie Skodowska Career Actions uh, presented by Celine uh, Peroni, policy officer at the Marie uh, Curie Skodowska Actions at the Directorate General for Education and Culture of the European Commission. Uh, this webinar is part of the fifth edition of the Unimet Week in Brussels, our annual event, which normally takes place in Brussels. And this year is exceptionally held on, fully online due to the COVID pandemic. We have at the moment some uh, uh, 20 uh, people connected. Welcome everyone. Um, it would be also great if you can introduce yourself by typing your name and the institution or just say hi in the chat box uh, here below at the bottom of uh, the Zoom screen. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Today is the 25th of June, 2020. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the UNMED website. So I also welcome those who will watch the recording afterwards. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box below at the bottom of the screen and we'll bring them up. We will have time for questions at the end. Also, you can raise your virtual hand and turn on your microphone, and we will take as many interventions as we can. Uh, we expect today to have uh, Celine's presentation and Q&A for some uh, 15 minutes. Then we will stop for 10 minutes for a virtual coffee break, let's say, and we will start again in one hour with the next session uh, chaired by Marcello Scalisi, the director of Funiman, who is with us already, and Fiorella Perotto from the unit, International Cooperation of the DG for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, who will present the EU-Africa Cooperation Framework in uh, Higher Education. And now we can turn the time over to you, Celine. Um, thank you again, Celine, for being here today. Uh, please, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So um, as Christina said, I am uh, from DGAC, uh, and but in particular from the Marie Skodowska Curie Unit. Uh, and today, the idea is to present uh, briefly, for those of you who might not know the program yet, so what are the uh, MSC about uh, and what are the possible opportunities and where we are we heading uh, towards the new program. So uh, let's start with a few uh, words of introduction. So for those of you who might not know what uh, Marie Skodowska Curie is about, I'm sure you heard the name already. Uh, so what are the key features? The key features are uh, to support the mobility, the training, the career development of researchers. Uh, the idea is to concentrate on uh, excellent science. It's one of the pillars of Horizon 2020. And uh, we are providing support through doctoral programs, postdoctoral fellowships, uh, and collaborative projects. So a very important thing is that the MSCA provides support to researchers at all stages of their careers. So this goes from doctoral to postdoctoral researchers and more experienced researchers. Uh, as I said, the MSCA are open to researchers of uh, uh, every stage of their career, but also all ages and uh, nationalities. And something that is really important and that uh, is, is very key to the success of the program is the bottom-up approach, meaning that researchers uh, are really have the full capacity to decide uh, and uh, which opportunity they want to explore and also to come up with their own solutions to, for instance, major challenges such as the current COVID outbreak. Uh, and stakeholders are very uh, keen of this bottom-up approach. It's not so many programs, European programs right now, that have this bottom-up dimension. 
uh, and it will definitely continue under the next uh, program. Another thing which is really important uh, is the inter interdisciplinary dimension. Uh, the idea is that uh, challenges are getting more complex and complex and they require collaboration between different disciplines and different uh, sectors for their solution. So this is a very strong dimension uh, in the Marie Skodowska reaction. Uh, of course, mobility uh, is, uh, is a key feature. So basically it's a key requirement actually. So funding is provided uh, on condition that the fellow moves uh, or are recently moved from a country to another. So international mobility. Uh, it's important to know that the MSCA is actually the most international component of uh, Horizon 2020. It accounts for more than half of all participations of third countries. So it, it's, it's a very much international uh, feature of the program. And uh, something that might be uh, interesting if universities are not familiar with the program it has, is that it involves so uh, international mobility within Europe. So we're talking about uh, European member states, but also uh, associated countries, but also between Europe and the rest of the world. So even non-associated countries, which are called third, third countries, can be involved. Uh, something about intersectoral mobility. Uh, the idea is that the MSA really encourage mobility between different sectors, and this goes beyond academia, actually. So, for instance, uh, businesses, including SMEs, uh, government, hospitals, non-profit organizations as well, cultural institutions can take part in the program, and this is something that we will uh, reinforce even further on the, on the horizon Europe. Um, something also that's uh, very important and that sometimes it's a bit uh, forgotten is that the MSCA is not just about individual mobility, but it also has a very clear impact at system level, meaning that uh, the MSCA projects have an impact, for instance, on uh, working conditions. Uh, they typically provide uh, good working conditions for researchers. So this includes, for instance, an employment contract, uh, which includes social security coverage. And researchers also received a fixed monthly allowance to cover the mobility, the mobility or the family costs. So it, it's all a whole, uh, it's a complete approach, which includes uh, uh, attractive working and employment conditions, and which really has an impact at national level. Uh, something on the impact of the MSCA. So as you can see, uh, we have nearly one, sorry, we have nearly uh, 140,000 researchers that have been supported so far. Uh, the figures that you see on the left are the uh, numbers for the Horizon 2020. So it's, uh, we're talking about a 6.2 billion budget. Uh, and uh, the idea is to support uh, around 65,000 researchers, including 25,000 PhD candidates. And this is actually the main uh, European funding instrument for doctoral training. Uh, here you can see, so on the left, uh, uh, the number of researchers that we actually uh, support. So as I said, we are around at 140,000 researchers right now, uh, and we aim to uh, reach one, uh, 145,000 researchers by uh, the end of 2020. And this includes around uh, 40,000 PhD candidates. On the right, this is the share of the budget, which is awarded to project that uh, help to tackle some of the uh, sustainable development goals. So you can see that there is quite a, a high share of projects that are funded. Uh, which are about sustainable development, climate change, and biodiversity. And we know that these are also very key uh, topics for uh, especially the Mediterranean uh, area. We have very positive effects on the, on the fellows' careers. Uh, as you can see, a very high share of them are uh, employed right after their MSCA fellowship. 
and we also have a very high proportion that are very satisfied with the innovative research training and professional development opportunities. Uh, a lot of them, 40%, were promoted to more senior positions. Uh, and uh, I would say that all of them recognize the positive impact that the MSCA had on their, on their career prospects. Uh, what I mentioned before and what we sometimes tend to forget is that the uh, MSCA is not just about uh, individual mobility, it's also uh, about having an impact on organizations and systems uh, at institutional or national level. So what we see uh, is that the MSCA helped to promote uh, a more transparent, impartial and uh, merit-based recruitment. What we also see is that uh, even after the project finishes, uh, the partnerships that was built uh, during the project will continue. Uh, organizations and especially universities uh, are very much encouraged to upscale their interna internationalization strategies. And overall, it really increases their capacity and their attractiveness at European and global level. So this is what we've seen uh, uh, basically over the years. And something that is also very important uh, is because how do you have an impact at system level? Uh, sometimes it can be very difficult, but in the case of MSCA, what we really see on the ground is that the structure of the actions of the projects and the requirements are basically translated into uh, institutional and national rules because they really are seen as an example of good practice. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, main, uh, let's say, achievements. Uh, I'm sure that this is the reason most people hear uh, about the Marie Skodowska Curie actions. Uh, it's about uh, the famous Nobel Prize winners, uh, the Oscar winners. There's a lot of researchers that are involved in the uh, discoveries such as the Higgs bosons and gravitational waves. Uh, it, it, there really is. Uh, and, and we see that the researchers that have been involved in an MSCA or uh, who have received uh, an MSCA fellowship um, have more, uh, are more represented in publications, international scientific publications, for instance. So there is a really, uh, in, there is a real impact on their career. This is a short glimpse of the participation of South Mediterranean countries. So basically, I am in charge of the South Mediterranean countries. I know uh, that uh, UNIMED, of course, is uh, much broader than this. Uh, but maybe just to give a glimpse, and we can come back to these slides if they are uh, of interest. Uh, so you can see this is for the period 2014-2020. Uh, and we have around uh, 300. 50 participation in total, might be a bit clearer here with around 220 projects. And you can see, for those who are familiar with the, with the acronyms, uh, you can see that there is a highest participation in uh, ITN, so the Innovative Training Networks. And this is followed by the RISE, so the Research and Innovation Staff Exchanges. Uh, and finally, by the fellowships, IF, uh, and the night as well. Uh, something and something that's important to remember is that uh, basically more than 50%, 57% actually of participation in the actions uh, are from universities and more than half of the budget of the MSCA uh, is dedicated to ITN, so the famous uh, innovative training networks which are actually to support doctoral programs and are mainly implemented by universities. So universities are really a key stakeholder in, in the actions. So as we are looking at, uh, at the next program, uh, we are also looking at what makes it uh, challenging to have a successful uh, career as a researcher today and especially uh, in a world which has changed a lot over the past months. So what we've seen uh, in our dialogue with stakeholders and uh, as we are looking to the next program, a lot is still being discussed, which is a very important uh, moment for us to, to gather feedback. 
what we have seen is that more than ever, we need a very strong international, intersectoral, interdisciplinary mobility and, cooper and cooperation. There is a very high uh, need to improve researchers' working environment uh, to ensure that brain circulation is more balanced across Europe uh, and beyond Europe. And this, uh, and there's also a very uh, high emphasis on providing researchers with the right skills. And this comes back also to the intersectoral dimension uh, and how can we strengthen uh, the links between academia and business. So these are a bit of the, of the direction which we are looking at. And these are basically already challenges that the, uh, the MSC are already responding to. Uh, as you probably already know, so the new commission has uh, six uh, high level, uh, let's say, political priorities. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And uh, as we are looking at the next program, uh, so this is the uh, preliminary, preliminary structure of the program. The idea is basically to build upon the success of Horizon 2020. So as you can see, we are keeping uh, the same approach, the same structure with three pillars. And the Maris Godowska Curie Action are part of the pillar one, just like it is now, uh, which is excellent science. Uh, the idea here is that we are looking at uh, significant improvements, but no radical change in the, for the next program. Uh, here you can see, so how will the MSCA fit under uh, Horizon Europe, as I just said, so the idea overall is to, uh, to continue on the success of Horizon 2020. Obviously, we're looking at uh, having an even, uh, an even major impact on researchers, institutions and systems. Uh, like I said, the international dimension of the program, which is really a, a key feature and, and this very specific uh, feature on the Horizon 2020 needs to be uh, strengthened. So we are going to build on, on this international dimension. Again, the intersectoral interdisciplinary characters. Uh, here you can see so the, the five main priorities. Uh, so obviously, the core business, let's say, remains uh, the mobility, the training uh, of researchers, but we're also looking uh, beyond how to spread best practices even more than now. Uh, and this goes across the whole uh, European research area. There is a very high emphasis on synergies, which are already very important, but we're looking really on how to uh, improve those synergies and public outreach which is also very important. And as you can see, the proposed budget by the commission is of 6.6 .6 billion. So the negotiations on the next uh, MF, MFF are really tough. So we're aiming to a slight increase. I'm not gonna spend too much time on, this is more the uh, policy background and what we're looking to. Something, yeah, something important is that we are also looking uh, on how the MSCA can uh, be a little greener under the next program. Uh, obviously, this is a way to have uh, an even more significant impact at policy level. And again, it is the idea that the MSCA has really seen as an example of best practice and often reproduced at national level. So we really want to set standards and, uh, and possibly drive change at institutional and national level. But it's also true that uh, the MSCA are a mobility program, uh, first, first of all. So there is an obvious impact on uh, in terms of greenhouse gases, uh, especially linked to air travel. So the idea is to, to try uh, to introduce measures that would help to significantly reduce the carbon footprint of MSCA projects. And this can be done in, in many ways. Uh, there is also the idea to increase awareness on any environmental issues. Uh, there is an opportunity to promote sustainable behaviors, so beyond the MSCA researchers, uh, and also to support policy and decision making. So how are we going to do this? So on the program perspective, uh, we are uh, thinking about having an MSCA Green Charter uh, we are thinking about green awards and possibly a green edition of the European Researchers' Night. 
and more on the policy level, uh, we are looking at portfolio analysis, thematic clustering, which can actually go beyond the MSCA, so even uh, including Erasmus Plus projects. Uh, guidance and training. So the idea is really to support decision making with concrete example of projects, for instance. Uh, this is about, so basically what are the general orientations towards the new MSCA? Uh, and this is common to a reflection that is going on for many uh, new, the new generation of European programs. So you can probably uh, see some common trends across the, the different programs. We're looking at having streamlined actions. Uh, we're looking at simplifying the rules. We're looking at making uh, things simpler for applicants and clearer, uh, which is always a challenge with European programs. Uh, mostly it will be a continuation of the grants that are already simplified right now. So it, it's very easy to apply already. So we will keep this approach. And, but we also need to look at demand management because obviously the MSCA is a very successful program, but it also means that success rates are uh, very, very low. So if we look um, especially at actions like the individual fellowships uh, or the ITNs, it, the success rate is, is pretty low compared to other programs. So uh, at the same time that this is the obvious consequence of uh, uh, aiming for excellent science, and promoting a bottom-up approach, excellence-based uh, actions. But at the same time, we need to look on how not to discourage, uh, especially very high quality applications from being submitted. So we have to tackle this uh, issue of demand management. Uh, structuring the effects, so of course, uh, this is a matter of in increasing the impact of the program. Uh, I mentioned before uh, the exposure beyond academia, so this is really a very high emphasis again, trying to improve the coherence between the actions. And something that I hinted before was also the synergies. So synergies not only within the program, but also between the different programs and even more importantly, uh, between different funding instruments. And especially with the uh, European structural funds. Uh, so this is a bit how it will look like uh, under the next program. Of course, this is, uh, this is all still under discussion. We're, we're drafting the WAP program in the, in the current months, but uh, this is uh, most likely how it will look like. So for those who are familiar with the uh, ITNs, it will become, uh, the name will change into doctoral networks. For the current individual fellowships, uh, it will be called uh, postdoctoral fellowships. The current rise will become staff exchanges. Uh, Cofund remains Cofund because uh, the name is pretty clear. And MSE and citizens uh, will actually include the uh, uh, European Researchers Night. So it will just have a broader name, but the European Night will keep uh, its well known name. So here the idea is just to make things a little bit clearer, especially for newcomers, which uh, might not be familiar with the, with the acronyms that we're very used to. So uh, just to give you maybe a quick overview of the different actions, and uh, we can come back to this maybe in the, in the question time. Uh, so concerning the doctoral network, so the current uh, ITNs, so again, we talk about continuation of what currently exists. So we'll continue to support doctoral candidates and programs. Uh, the idea is to simplify. So instead of having three sub actions right now, it will be a single action. But we will have incentives uh, for the industrial or the current doctorates that you, that you would know. Uh, there is no change in the project implementation. We're still talking about four years. Uh, all the fellows need to be enrolled in doctoral training and the funding for maximum 36 uh, research amounts remains uh, unchanged. Again, this is all currently on the discussion, so uh, things mm, are subject possibly to change. As I said before, it's important for us to uh, manage the demand and try to improve uh, the success rates. So this is why there will be a reduced number of fellow months in the project. 
but with a still 540 plus a month for the industrial or the joint doctorate. So <clears throat> basically we try to simplify the action by removing uh, sub actions, but we keep the incentives so that we make sure that industrial or joint doctorates are still uh, being incentivized. And there will be restricted uh, resubmissions, again, to avoid that uh, the same applications that were below the quality threshold are again submitted in very similar fresh patients. So this will be the, the idea and some guidelines for supervisors. Now for the future uh, individual fellowships, so postdoctoral fellowships. Again, here we continue uh, supporting postdoctoral research and careers. We continue funding uh, all research domains. Uh, and to clarify, uh, here again, we will have a single action. So this will be a bit different from now with two destinations. So it can be Europe, European or global. And we will replace the current panels with incentives. So this is the general idea. Uh, what doesn't change is the duration. So for European destination, we still have one to two years and global destination two to three years. Uh, as I mentioned several times now, uh, the idea is really to develop skills that are needed for academia and beyond. Uh, so we really want to provide incentives for uh, second months to training, for, for example, in entities that go beyond academia. Uh, there will be also improved guidance on uh, career development, which is often uh, underlooked. And the idea here again is to manage uh, the increasing demand uh, to maintain that the, at the same time that the selection remains of very high quality, it is uh, the really the threshold for evaluation are extremely high right now, but we also try to improve the success rate. Uh, concerning staff exchanges, so the current uh, RISE action, uh, this, is, uh, this is the most international action on the Messier actually. It's, uh, it's, usually it's a very good entry point for new newcomers in the program. Uh, the idea is to, um, to support staff exchanges. It's open to any type of staff, so academia or administrative staff. Uh, again, here we're talking about international, intersectoral, interdisciplinary secondments. Um, and we are, uh, we are keeping the four years for project implementation, so no change on this. So what is new instead uh, is that interdisciplinary secondments will be possible within Europe. And here again, we have the number of months, which is a little bit reduced to three, uh, 360 to make projects more manageable and also to have more consistency between the different actions. MSA Coffin, so the fourth action, uh, Coffin remains Coffin, uh, so no um, significant changes here. We will continue to support uh, the co funding of national, regional, institutional schemes, and this goes for both doctoral and postdoctoral fellowships. And, uh, and here we're really looking at synergies, uh, so how we can really uh, maximize the impact of this action. Uh, spread best practices. Uh, there will be a greater focus on new beneficiaries, so trying to get newcomers into this action. And there will be a simplification uh, for the minimum remuneration. There will still be a limit to uh, 10 million euros per beneficiary per call. And the maximum duration remains unchanged as well. So let's say if we want to uh, summarize a little bit uh, what is going to change in this action, uh, there will also be a single mobility rule, uh, which means that uh, researchers may have resided or carried out their main activity, be it work or studies, in the country of their host organization for more than 12 months. So in the three years before the application uh, or the applicable reference date, so this can change depending on the action. Uh, there is a new, we have tried to clarify the definitions, especially the categories of doctoral candidates. So we're talking about doctoral candidates now instead of early stage researchers and postdoctoral researchers instead of experienced researchers. So trying to make things a little bit simpler. And we try to really uh, harmonize, not just across the actions, but also 
uh, with the rest of Horizon Europe, again, to make the program easier and uh, to apply for and uh, more accessible. The last action that I mentioned, uh, MSC and citizens, so the name changes, but it will continue to be the European Researchers' Night. Uh, in 2019 edition, we had uh, 1.6 million visitors across all events uh, that took place, and it will be extended under Horizon Europe to uh, outreach events. We are also very much looking on how, uh, as I said, this is uh, a very high uh, political priority, not only on the commission of the commission, but also of the council presidencies. So you certainly have heard a lot about green circulation in the past months. Uh, so what we currently have, because obviously, so there is still a, a very clear divide uh, between, uh, between countries, between regions uh, within Europe and beyond. Uh, and on the one hand, the MSCA are very much focused on scientific excellence and there is no geographical criteria, so there is no incentives at geographical level. But under the, uh, the widening, uh, spreading excellence and widening participation part of the program, there are a number of actions that are being taken to try to uh, balance a bit more this brain circulation. And in particular, we're looking at widening countries. Uh, you can see the list uh, at the bottom of the slide. So these are the current uh, widening countries, but there is slightly change under the next program, but not that much. And the idea is really uh, to have some measures that can uh, improve brain circulation towards these countries. And for instance, the widening fellowships uh, has been a very successful pilot, which was uh, uh, launched in 2018, and it uh, will continue for still one year. Uh, and we are now looking at the results, and there is a, a really, uh, there is a real impact on the success rates of those widening countries uh, in the first call, and again in the second call, so we will be looking at the third call. But we really expect that the, the impact will continue to be positive, and we will continue to look uh, at other possibilities to even increase the participation of these countries in the program. And especially next year, uh, we will have a study analyzing uh, brain drain and trying to propose new solutions. Uh, so, but th there is a very clear focus uh, on this as a, as a political priority, actually. Other activities that are part of the MSC, but I uh, certainly didn't have the time to go through them all. Uh, research as a school, we have a Marie Alumni Association, there is a support to the MSC and NCPs, and in particular in widening countries. Uh, there is a project called Researchers at Risk, and the Seal of Excellence, you might have heard, some universities are supporting Seal of Excellence recipients uh, for MSC postdocs and co funding uh, these are a few links, if you wish to uh, learn more, and, uh, and some contact emails. So this is it for me. Thank you. Well, that's okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful, Celine. Um, is there any questions from uh, the participants? Uh, thank you, Celine, also for anticipating uh, the measures and the new schemes that the European Commission is considering for the new Marie Skodowska reactions. It's interesting to see how the names change as well and how the program is trying to be more truly open to, to the world. Yes, the idea is, uh, well, the change in the names is really to and make it simpler, you know that applicants are often lost in front of all the different European programs and it will help newcomers to uh, apply and, uh, and get funded under the, under the next program, possibly. Yes, indeed I have a question, um, which is like more an, like an opinion uh, based on your, on your experience. Uh, what, what would be um, like your top recommendation to um, the South Mediterranean universities 
or also the European universities to widen participation of universities and researchers in the actions? Or um, what would be like, what are the current mistakes that um, researchers and universities should avoid in, in your opinion? Well, mostly the most important point, well, and this is common to the different action, is really um, to try to uh, make very good use of the evaluation uh, results and especially the evaluation uh, comments and feedback that is provided. Uh, obviously, it, diff it varies according to the, to the action, so maybe the level of comments and feedback is different, but uh, of course, the success rates are, are not very not very high, so the competition is really really uh, tough to get funded. But something that that we spend a lot of uh, because obviously we know that it's difficult to get in, uh, and we really try to put a lot of effort into the quality of the comments that is provided, the, the quality of the feedback, because it's very easy to uh, submit again the same proposal. But we would really like applicants to submit an even better proposal on the next call. And this is why uh, the measures that we have trying, that we are thinking of in terms of limiting the exact same resubmissions, uh, we hope that this will uh, push applicants to look more into their, their application. And especially if it's under the quality threshold, to uh, take into, into account the comments and the feedback, because we, we really see Again, this depends on the action, but in certain action, the, the rate of resubmissions from one year to, a, to the next is really high. And resubmission means that, uh, well, we, we can set different criteria, but we are talking about 70% of the consortium, which is the same, for instance, for ITNs, and 70% of the, of the text is the same from one year to another. So then, um, it, obviously, we, we are trying to, uh, to help applicants as much as we can in our feedback to try to make sure that there is less identical resubmissions and possibly to increase the, the quality level. But of course, uh, the budget is what it is. <laughs> so uh, the negotiation for the, for the next program and for the next budget are really tough in the, in, the, in the parliament, in the council. So we will see what the final number is, but we don't expect a huge increase for, for my school of Skykiri. So we really need to make sure that the money uh, it, it has, has a maximum impact and uh, the quality will certainly remain very high. But so if the recommendation to applicants is, of course, keep applying because the, the, the average quality of proposal is definitely very high and this is common to all countries. Um, and, but we also need to really look into the quality of applications. So uh, really take into, into account the, the feedback and the comments which are provided with the evaluation score and, uh, and try to uh, use it for the next application if they're not successful this time. No, yeah, good point. May I have, uh, may I make some question to Celine? Sorry, but I'm using my mobile because they are managing to, to solve some problem on my laptop. And I don't want to use my camera if possible with my mobile. Celine, could you come back to the slide about the figures of uh, Southern Mediterranean participation in uh, the Mariscodowska reactions? So, and, uh, yeah, just to specify, so these are South Mediterranean countries. Of course, Unimed is, is uh, broader than this, but here you would have uh, some of the, um, so part of the country which are part of the networks. Yeah, okay. This is quite interesting um, to see. Of course, uh, Israel play an important role in, this, uh, in these figures and considering obviously the, the, the the interaction among Israeli universities and European universities. But my question related to that is, um, you obviously said that the, the evaluation of research candidature are related to the quality of the, the candidature in itself, which is obviously important. But um, I have some comment on this. First of all, you talk about uh, brain circulation, 
and you know that these are very sensitive issues when we come we discuss about southern Mediterranean countries about brain drain and so on. Uh, if there is any action to um, disincentivate this uh, brain drain, potential brain drain, or if you have any uh, comment on this and so on. And another um, issue that you mentioned this for the future of the program, but generally speaking, I think that is also for the current one, current one is the public outreach. Uh, I think that looking in particular at the mobility of researchers coming from neighboring countries, and I don't want to say just Mediterranean, but neighboring countries, and considering the uh, political challenges that we have with some of these countries, could it be important to have a very a stronger action of public outreach to to show that there is a research community that is in working with European academic community and that we are doing our common efforts to solve some uh, of our common priorities, uh, looking at research and, and what you are thinking because public outreach, I see the point to organize public events involving people, but citizen in itself, but it's quite complicated when we come back when we discuss about research. And, and the last uh, uh, comment is about the, uh, if uh, you are thinking, if possible, to have uh, a specific spaces for calls related to researcher coming from crisis situation countries or refugees or in a war contest like Yemen, or Syria, or Libya, and so on. And of course, if there is any timetable for the next calls. Thank you. Sorry for all these questions. No, no worries. I'm happy to, um, to reply. So on the, on the first one on the brain circulation, so yes, it's definitely a very uh, sensitive, uh, sensitive topic. Uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned, it is very high in the political agenda. We just uh, concluded a, a presidency conference last, uh, uh, last Friday on brain circulation, actually. And this was organized by the Croatian um, presidency of the council. Uh, so there is a high focus on brain circulation. Everyone is talking about it. And it is a very complex issue, actually. And obviously, the uh, Marie Skodowska curie actions are can be part of the solution, but it's definitely not the main uh, uh, the main solution to, to these issues. It really requires a, a multi-level intervention, be it being at local level, national level, and European level. Of course, can uh, the European uh, Commission can do its part, but mostly uh, when we're looking at brain circulation, um, we're looking at attractive working conditions and living conditions as well, and career prospects, career opportunities. So for this, the main instrument remains the, the cohesion policy, the European cohesion policy with the structural funds. Uh, how do we make sure that countries have an attractive research and, and innovation environment? So how do we make sure that uh, the researchers that move back or move to these countries uh, are supported in, in having uh, career opportunities? And it requires uh, infrastructures at national, local, institutional level. So th there are really a number of um, of, uh, of prerequisites that are uh, that go very much beyond the MSEA. And uh, the main instrument in this respect uh, remains the European Structural Funds. This being said, of course, the MSEA can uh, are about mobility of researchers. So. Uh, we uh, definitely have a, a role to play and there is definitely a, an agreement on this. Uh, so it can be an instrument to, um, to help to try to make this brain circulation more balanced. And uh, as I mentioned before, so one very key element uh, is the impact that we are trying to strengthen on the, at system level. So making sure that uh, what we provide during the MSCA fellowship, for instance, the working conditions, the, the support at uh, contract employment in terms of social security and everything is has an impact in terms of uh, being a best practice and that is again reproduced uh, beyond the MSCA project and this is really happening this is what we have seen uh, in many countries of course it's a very slow process 
so it cannot uh, it will certainly take uh, a very long time but there are other measures as i mentioned the difficulty with the msea is that we are part of the uh, excellent science pillar of the program meaning that we cannot uh, uh, we cannot base the uh, the funding on geographical criteria but because we know that this is a very important issue the the agreement with uh, because this is obviously a member state um, very strong position that the msc remains based on excellence so the uh, the agreement with the member states is that uh, we we are using the widening part of the program to fund some actions like i mentioned in the end the widening fellowships but there are also more actions we are especially supporting the widening countries, the NCPs, the so-called national contact points, in those widening countries with specific projects and specific funding. And uh, there is also, um, so the bigger impact was the impact of the widening fellowship. So if I go back to the figures, what we have seen in the past three years is that there is definitely an increase in success rates and uh, what we manage, what the widening fellowship managed to achieve is that to bring close the success rates of the widening countries much closer to the success rate of uh, widening and non-widening countries taken together. So there is, there is a clear uh, increase, not only in the success rate actually, but also in the applications. So the idea is to uh, to build on this very successful pilot and possibly to fund it with a bigger budget under the next program so that we can fund more projects. And this means that more researchers will be able to go to widening countries. You have to know also that uh, in the MSCA, uh, we have many researchers already that use the MSCA to go back to their country of origin. So there is already a kind of balancing effect. It's still not enough, obviously but it's already there. So the idea is really to put more emphasis on, the, on these actions and possibly new actions as well under the, the next program. So this was, uh, I hope this answers the first question. Uh, on the public, uh, public outreach, uh, public outreach is a, yes, it's always a difficult uh, issue. How do you communicate and how do you support uh, the connection with citizens especially so there is a, we have different tools for this uh, we will have a broader action and then the next program so the the current european research night uh, will become a, a slightly broader action so we will be able to support more outreach events uh, and this we can really be on a very strong uh, brand here because it's really widely recognized it, it has a huge uh, visibility across Europe uh, and beyond so we really uh, there is a, a real opportunity to even have a higher visibility for, for, for such event and to increase the, the outreach indeed uh, the other uh, networks that we're using are the uh, Marie Curie uh, Alumni Association, which also has a very broad, it's a very broad network and the researchers uh, really appreciate from the feedback that we get from them. Uh, it's a very active community and there really, there is a, a very high sense of ownership as well. So this is also a way to uh, keep the researchers that have been funded under MSCA together and try to uh, increase the networking and opportunities between them. Uh, and finally, we very much rely on the national contact points. So not only within the EU, but national contact points everywhere, which are kind of our, uh, the voice of the program uh, locally and institutionally, it's very important. Of course, there could be more to be done. So, but again, we are, we, this is the very right moment if you have ideas on how to better involve the uh, NCPs under the next program to share recommendations with us uh, because we are really right now reflecting on uh, the concrete measures under the next uh, work program. And concerning the last question, uh, if you can remind me. Yeah, I think it was about the next uh, open calls, so the last calls for the current programs in September. If you want if there are informations about that, just as a reminder. 
Uh, yes, so we will see four calls, five calls have already been opened this year, but two I think are already closed. But I would definitely encourage you to check the, the website for That's next fine. year. So if you go to, uh, uh, it's... Uh, I think that the website in your last slide where people can check the open calls. Yeah, actually. Yeah. So you can definitely uh, check the current calls. The uh, individual fellowships is the, is uh, will be open, I think, in September. But I would need to check the exact date. So just refer to the website for the next call for 2021. Uh, there might be some changes because obviously we cannot publish the call uh, before we have a legal base and uh, before we have a clear, uh, obviously, budget indication for the next actions. So the the calls in 2021 will might be slightly different compared to the current program. So definitely refer to the website; they will be clearly announced. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the the website will be updated uh, absolutely for sure. Great, thank you. I hope this answers most of the. Good, good, good. I think. Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Ahmad, for sharing the link uh, on the chat. Uh, it looks like we have covered all the questions. Is there anything else you, Celine or Machala, want to cover before the virtual coffee break? Uh, I think that was it. And for any question, please uh, feel free to uh, write any email. So you have the two emails on the last slide. I'm sure the slide will be shared with uh, with all participants as well. So. Thank you. Thank you also for your Yeah, sure. More. We, the, 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 the webinar is recorded and we, <laughs> will be published in our uh, YouTube channel, in our website for our members and not only for people that want to know more about the results of the Unimed Week. Uh, we know that in these days, in these weeks, there are a lot of webinars and also academics are doing online lessons, online examination is very complicated life. And I thank the participants for this first session to, to stay with us. But uh, of course, we will try to do as much as possible to, to invite our researchers through our institutions, through our members, to consider MSHCA as an, an important tool more than uh, the, 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 what that has been done for the current program uh, because it's the way to improve also to do some capacity building, not only research, but to do some capacity building for researchers and for their own institution. And this is one of the most important priority for, for UNIMED activity to act as a, a, a player to improve the capacity of uh, our members, I have to say both sides, both sides. Thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Thank you to all the participants for joining us today. Now we stop for some five minutes. You can stay in the room, grab your coffee, and in five minutes we will start with the next session about the EU-Africa Cooperation Framework in Higher Education. Thank you again. First of all, most of the Southern Mediterranean countries, and I mean, of course, the North Africa uh, countries, uh, part of the EU Africa cooperation framework, of course. But at the same time, they have a very huge experiences of cooperation with the European uh, Commission with you, through European programs. In this sense, they could play an important role uh, because they already know how to cooperate with the European uh, Commission and European Union frameworks and rules. And at the same time, they are very interested, and I hope that some of our members will confirm this. They have a lot of interest to in reinforce the international dimension, also looking to their own African neighborhood. Uh, on the other side, the, 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 the European universities, uh, obviously they have a strong uh, relation, relationship with obviously not for all, but most of European universities, they already have uh, a, a strong cooperation framework with African universities. I mean, African excluded the North African, but 
we include in the Mediterranean dimension. It is a, an important program, this EU-Africa cooperation, because could, could be the way uh, to improve this international dimension, to improve the relationship among African universities and European universities. Uh, some years ago, we launched an initiative that we have to relaunch, to reinforce, that was uh, called UNIMED for Africa. This initiative was launched when there was nothing related to cooperation with Africa. Uh, mi sentite adesso? Molto bene. Mi... Ah, perfetto. Io vi vedo. Mi vedete? Non ancora. Ah. <laughs> Okay, I was uh, Fiorella explaining the reason why we are interested to know more about the EU Africa cooperation framework and of course looking at the, the, the cooperation on uh, university dimension and uh, the education framework. And I was also explaining the reason why is an important tool for first of all for North African universities because they already they are part of the EU Africa framework in any case. And they already have a huge experiences of cooperation with the European programs, with the European uh, framework, with the European framework in any case, but also is an important tool for European universities that they already have a, a framework of cooperation with African universities and this could be an opportunity to improve this, uh, this dimension. The last comment that I would like to mention to you in particular is that some years ago, before the EU Africa Cooperation Framework, the Africa Cluster Fund and so on, UNIMED launched an initiative that was called UNIMED for Africa. The idea was to collect initiative and opportunity from our members open for uh, cooperation with uh, African universities. And we will go after your presentation, sure, we will go to relaunch this initiative and to invite our members, both sides, the North African and the European side of uh, Mediterranean, to uh, start again to think about this and uh, why not to be more active in this framework. Obviously, UNIMED does not uh, the goal to open the door to African universities in our network. We are always concentrated in our Euro-Mediterranean region. But in any case, we are very interested to do as much as possible to improve the quality, to improve the uh, capacity of African university through our members. Please, Fiorella, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcello, and uh, good morning to uh, all the participants. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, an overview of uh, the uh, various instruments and initiatives concerning uh, uh, Africa-European Union cooperation on higher education. Regarding uh, UNIMED, just a personal remark, I had the pleasure last year uh, of uh, attending in Cairo uh, a conference organized by the um, uh, Association of African Universities. Uh, so it was the conference of, uh, of rectors and vice chancellors. And uh, I had there the opportunity to meet uh, many representatives from the North African universities and of course also of other of Sub-Saharan Africa. So it was really, really a pleasure to get into touch with this, this reality of, of, of Egypt in particular, but of Northern Africa in, uh, more in general. Okay, I will share my presentation. Um, so um, I understand so I'll have, uh, uh, maybe I need a little bit of help. My presentation is now open. Um, just a second, I need to upload it. Uh, could I please get a little bit of help for uploading uh, my presentation? I understand I need to yeah. share yeah. it. Yeah. There's a share screen at the bottom of the yes, Zoom. Yes, yes. You should yes. just go there and uh, pick yeah. up your presentation. So I'm on share screen and then... Um... 
then you may be able to see what your presentation is. You don't, you don't, you don't need to share. No, but uh, how, do you, how do I, yeah, I'm, I'm on share your entire screen. Uh, this is not. Your presentation, you should open your presentation. It is, on your it is open. Computer. It yeah, is open, just yes. Where the, just select the window where the presentation is. Select, what do you mean by select? Because just I mean, tick. I, it's not, it's not, it does not appear uh, on the share screen. My presentation does not appear on the share screen. Uh, could you eventually, um, could you send us the email and I will share the, the, my screen? Okay, because, Please. Uh, yeah, I will. About it, the, I mean, the title of my presentation uh, is, I mean, of course, my presentation will deal with higher education cooperation uh, between Africa and the European Union and the framework for cooperation. But I uh, wanted to put as a general title towards a comprehensive strategy with Africa, because that is the title of what is now the current main policy framework uh, for cooperation. Uh, between between Africa and the European Union. Okay, the message has been sent, so you should hopefully receive it very soon. Uh, this this communication is a joint communication from the European Commission and the High Representative of, of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, and was adopted on the 9th of March of this year. Uh, so already during the uh, the COVID-19 lockdown, actually, uh, and. Uh, Okay, I hope it's, 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 I mean, apparently it's rather a big file, so it may take some time, but um, this, uh, this communication has identified six main priorities for cooperation between Africa and the European Union. Uh, and it is about partnerships. So it is about not just the European Union helping and supporting Africa, but it's really working in partnership together to solve common problems and, and common issues. And these issues are, uh, first of all, the green transition and access to energy, the digital transformation, sustainable growth and jobs, and peace and governance, and migration and mobility. These are the six priorities that have been identified for cooperation between Africa and the European Union. And this is the proposal that the European Union is making to, to Africa, and in particular to the African Union. Uh, these proposals will be discussed later this year, probably in October, at the sixth uh, summit between the African Union and the European Union. Um, the communication uh, puts a strong focus on investing in people, uh, in particular in, in young people, uh, because this is very important to build a stronger partnership between Africa and the European Union. Uh, we all know that um, the population uh, in Africa is very young. Uh, within the next 15 years, uh, there will be 375 uh, uh, million young people uh, who will reach working age in Africa. Uh, however, less than 10% of African young people aged between 18 and 24 years old are enrolled in post-secondary education or training, only less than 10%. Therefore, all these people will have, of course, very few chances of making it to higher education. And um, providing education, training and, and skills and preparing young people for the opportunities of the future labor market is a common strategic priority, both for Africa and for the European Union. Um, to, to, to reap the economic opportunities of, uh, of, of all these transformations, uh, young people need access to education, but this education must be of good quality, it must be inclusive, and it must be equitable, including higher education. 
Um, there is also a, um, a focus in this communication on uh, special, special attention for uh, girls and women in general. So for supporting access of women, of young girls to knowledge and to skills, because this opens the doors for them to further uh, uh, well-being and to further uh, development, for example, access to entrepreneurship, to funding, etc. So as I said, uh, I mean, this year will be the year of the sixth African Union European Union Summit. Sorry, I'm just really having connection problems because my, my, uh, my presentation is not, uh, I have sent it, but it has not it's, been not it's not yet arrived, of course. It's not yet arrived. No, I, I can see you. that. I can see that, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it I hope it's just a matter of, of time. Yeah, okay. But as I was saying, so this year we will have this sixth uh, African Union European Summit, so involving all the heads of state uh, and government of the African Union and the European Union. Uh, 2020 will also be an important year because it will mark the end of the negotiations uh, of the new partnership agreement between uh, the European Union and the group of African, Caribbean and Pacific countries. But of course, 2020 will probably be remembered uh, for something else, for the, for the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected and is still affecting many parts of the world, including Europe and Africa. And this is why uh, the European Commission um, has also adopted very recently uh, another communication, which is called Team Europe. Uh, which is in fact the global response of the European Union to COVID-19. It is um, a single framework of action for all the uh, external response of the European Union in support of its partners across the world, so including Africa, uh, and precisely to address the COVID-19 crisis and the COVID-19 recovery. Um, and uh, it addresses both short-term, short-term emergency, issues as well as longer term response uh, in support of, uh, uh, of, of the different partners of the European Union. And uh, there is uh, in this communication also a focus on education and in particular to uh, the need to ensure continuity of the provision of education at all levels of education and the European Union uh, is um, determined to help uh, on this side, especially on this particular, on this particular aspect. Um, there is, a, okay, I think that, have you received the presentation? I think it has gone, not yet. Okay. Not yet, but don't worry. Okay, sorry. Go ahead because okay, you, are, continue, you are going very well. Don't worry about it. Okay. When they arrive, so, I, will, um, I will join you. Yeah, <laughs> before I'm finished. Okay, so um, I now go back to the, uh, communi the, the communication on Africa, so towards a comprehensive strategy with Africa to give you a little bit more detail about it. Uh, of course, this uh, communication wants to help address the new challenges, as I said, but also the new prospects, the new opportunities for both Africa and the European Union. So from the uh, point of the economic, political, social, technological, demographic, environmental, climate uh, changes. So um, there are, as I said, uh, there is, as I said, a number of priorities. One of them uh, is sustainable growth uh, and jobs. And the European Union is proposing a specific action under this priority of sustainable jobs and growth, uh, which is uh, to partner with Africa to rapidly enhance learning, knowledge and skills, research and innovation capacities, in particular for women and youth. So there is this idea of enhancing learning, knowledge and skills, so education, but also research and innovation, which are closely linked. Uh, so developing capacities and to support women and youth who are very often the more vulnerable groups in, in, these, in this kind of, of, of reforms and of processes. So it means scaling up cooperation between 
in Africa and European Union in academic and scientific cooperation, but also, for example, on technical, vocational and education and training um, to cooperate with uh, or, or to um, encourage cooperation between uh, education, uh, higher education uh, institutions and businesses uh, to help create a kind of the, the, the so-called knowledge society or knowledge, knowledge economy. Um, from the EU point of view, it is also very important to enhance the mobility of students, of teachers, of trainers and of researchers. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has stopped international mobility for the time being temporarily. Um, individual international mobility will remain the core of international cooperation for us, especially for cooperation between uh, the European Union and Africa in education. However, of course, until mobility can be safely resumed, the European Union uh, has decided to focus, for example, on virtual mobility on, or on so-called uh, blended mobility, so on a combination of virtual uh, exchanges and of uh, physical exchanges. And I'm thinking here, talking about virtual mobility, of the Erasmus Plus virtual exchanges. I believe you had a presentation uh, during your, your conference, uh, which are the perfect example of, 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 uh, of um, virtual online mobility. Uh, and we are also thinking of combining both virtual and physical mobility, for example, by uh, allowing students to start uh, a mobility experience first virtually, uh, meaning uh, through activities organized by their host institutions, by their host universities in a different country. Uh, but then, whenever this is safe and possible, to continue these activities physically through physical mobility in the host country uh, later on. And in addition to uh, developing uh, this virtual mobility, blended mobility, uh, we are also planning to focus very much on capacity building. So the idea that in programs like Erasmus Plus, there is much more than mobility. They are not only about mobility. And so we want to stimulate exchanges, not only between higher education institutions in the European Union and in Africa, but within Africa itself. So between African uh, universities. Uh, and um, with a focus on the most uh, pressing uh, topics, the most pressing issues, for example, on the development of digital competencies and skills uh, and other priority areas, and also on quality training for teachers. So this is, these are a bit our uh, strategic plans uh, for, for the future. Um, now, um, I wanted to, sh and this is a pity that I cannot show you the slide because here the slide could have been useful. And in fact, I want to uh, give you an overview uh, of the different uh, European Union actions and instruments that can support all these political goals and also maybe a little bit of a glimpse into the proposals for the future. I'm just sorry, I'm just double checking if, uh, have, you, have you received the slides or not yet? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Hello? loud and, loud and clear. Ah, okay, sorry, okay. Uh, I think the slides have left my computer. <laughs> Can you please double check if Mr. Scalisi has received them? I have put Ludovica in copy as well. Yeah, I also asked it to Ludovica, but we, she didn't receive them, me too. I no? Mean, ah. Not yet. Okay, because they are not on my screen anymore. So it's as if my, my, uh, my mail had, had left. I, I also checked in the, the, the Yeah, it's folder. in my sent, it's in my sent mails. So. Yeah, but uh, you know, from Brussels to Rome, Piano, piano. Yeah, <laughs> very, we are very far away indeed. <laughs> okay, so um, I mean, I hope that you, you will be able to see this slide because uh, uh, it, I think it shows uh, uh, in a schematic way 
um, the various instruments. And the main instruments that we use to support Africa-EU cooperation in higher education are related to three main policy areas, which are, first of all, education and youth, then research and innovation, and then development cooperation. So these three uh, policy areas, education and youth, research and innovation, development cooperation. Uh, they are kind of the three main pillars on which uh, cooperation in higher education is based between, uh, between the African Union and the European Union. Uh, sorry, Fiorella, I received this. I, I don't know if it's uh, the right one. Uh, if it comes from me, it should be the right one, I suppose. I probably have to enlarge the screen. Sorry, okay. Yes, that's right, yes. I am now on the fourth slide. So the slide with the main instruments, it's the fourth, it's page four. This one? No, uh, further up. And I mean, while there is a little request uh, of clarifications, from Alicia, um, did she says, did I understand so correctly that, that the EU will promote mobility within Africa? Uh, will there be specific funding from intra-African yes. mobility, therefore? Yes, absolutely, yes. Sorry, you have to go up. Can you go to the top of the presentation? Sure, 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 sure. Where you, you are at the end, so maybe it's easier to start from the top. Yes, I will, I will reply on this. I mean, we already have opportunities for uh, exchanges uh, and cooperation between African institutions, and I will mention this in my presentation. And we, yes, thank you. You can, can now move down, please. Yes, then uh, move further down. Further down. Okay, stop. Yes, yes, this is the, this is the, the slide. Yes, indeed, um, talking about intra-Africa cooperation, uh, they are, um, yes, I'm sorry, I sent you my own version with my notes, so you don't need to show the notes. I mean, uh, it's, it's just the, the, the image that is, is, is quite important. Uh, we have, uh, through the, the Pan-African program, uh, uh, an action which is called Intra-Africa Academic Mobility Scheme, uh, which has been in existence for a very long time. It used to be called ACP, uh, African Mobility Scheme, and um, it is extremely successful. And uh, we, we are definitely, we definitely have the intention to continue this, this action uh, in, in the future. Um, so, uh, but I will tell you more maybe uh, later on. So here you see uh, the three uh, main policy areas I was talking about. So the three main pillars for uh, cooperation in higher education between Africa and European Union. And you can see that, for example, uh, in relation to the uh, education and youth policy area, let's say, the main instrument, the main funding program is the Erasmus Plus program, of course. For research and innovation, the main instrument is the Horizon 2020 program, which will be followed as from next year by the Horizon Europe uh, program. And in development cooperation, we have a number of cooperation instruments. We have the Pan-African program, which is a program that uh, is applied uh, on a continental level. And then we have European Development Fund, uh, the development cooperation instruments that address uh, specific countries or specific regions. Um, in each of these, um, of these programs um, covers uh, different types of activities. Uh, they cover mobility, for example, Erasmus Plus, you, you, you know, uh, covers individual mobility of, of students and teachers and staff. Uh, the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions uh, in the um, Horizon 2020 program also cover mobility, but it's mobility of researchers. Uh, so the individual fellowships for, for researchers and the Pan-African program uh, covers, as I said, this intra-Africa academic mobility scheme, which is uh, about exchanges of students, of teachers, of academic staff between African universities. 
um, and uh, but also the European Development Fund and the uh, Development Cooperation Instruments provide significant top up in terms of funds to the Erasmus Plus budget to fund mobility and capacity building in Africa. Uh, EDF, uh, so European Development Fund for the uh, African countries who are part of the ACP uh, uh, partnership and the DCI, for example, for countries like South Africa. So um, these uh, various instruments are similar as regards the type of actions, but of course their object they serve different policy objectives that are complementary to each other. Uh, there are also other funds, uh, for example, uh, there is also the Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, uh, which is, uh, has been established to address the root causes of irregular migration. And uh, there again, there are funds available to top up the Erasmus Plus, uh, the Erasmus Plus budget for, for the mobility activities. Um, so um, these pro programs are complementary, for example, uh, under the Pan-African program, in addition to the uh, Inter-Africa Academic Mobility Scheme, uh, we also fund uh, other kinds of, of actions which are more strategic, which target a systemic uh, uh, transformation of uh, higher education systems. And uh, I will give you some examples uh, maybe later on. Maybe we can move to the, um, to the next slide, please. The tune, well, yes, very good. So tuning, uh, tuning Africa is uh, a, an initiative that is funded through the Pan-African program and is one of these strategic, more strategic initiatives, more systemic initiatives. Tuning uh, is not about mobility, is about uh, cooperation between uh, African institutions in particular disciplines, so between academics, uh, who are uh, expert in specific disciplines from specific universities in Africa, who together review or, uh, curricula, academic curricula in their discipline or who develop new curricula together uh, in order to have a kind of harmonized understanding. They do not write national curricula or the university's curricula together. They agree on a common understanding of what they want the students to learn, what the students first need to learn, how they need to learn it, in how much time, uh, and how much work this is going to involve. And this exercise has already been done, as you can see from, from the slide, in a number of academic disciplines, from agriculture to teacher education, through engineering, medicine, etc. And all the uh, results of uh, this work are public, they are, they are published they are accessible, uh, including, uh, of course, the names and the details of the uh, academics and the, of the universities who have participated in this collaborative work of harmonization uh, and of quality assurance uh, in higher education. This uh, action uh, has already been carried out in two phases. We hope there will be another one, a next one, if possible, in the future. Uh, up to now, uh, it has involved 41 African countries, 107 universities, 124 representatives, meaning academics, uh, plus students also, because the students have also tested some parts of, this, uh, of the results, and also regional bodies in charge of higher education and students. And the Tuning Africa, its results, uh, will also support the African credit transfer system. And the whole idea is also to support the, um, uh, the African Union's uh, continental education strategy uh, for Africa, uh, which uh, targets the uh, in increasing integration uh, of education systems in Africa that should also support uh, a greater uh, geographical integration between the different African countries. So this is one example. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank uh, the HACWA slide, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. So uh, another example is the HACWA initiative, also funded by the Pan-African program, uh, which uh, aims to develop harmonized quality assurance and accreditation criteria and systems uh, in Africa at the different levels, institutional, national, regional, and continental. Uh, 
again for Hakwa, uh, there has already been a first phase. Uh, they are now starting the second phase uh, and the idea is really to consolidate the achievements that have been uh, uh, reached through the first phase and to uh, now disseminate these achievements, these results more widely through training, uh, training activities in, uh, in, in universities um, and uh, with the different uh, stakeholders uh, that are directly involved in, in, in quality assurance in higher education uh, and to reach out to uh, the, maybe the more difficult to reach out so not only to big universities uh, in, in, the, in the big cities and in the capital cities but also to reach out to more to more these decentralized uh, uh, establishments, institutions in, in Africa. Uh, okay, so this is, um, this was another example of a systemic kind of project. May I see the next slide, please? Uh, this is also um, uh, an interesting pilot project, uh, again funded by the Pan-African Programme, that combines mobility and capacity building. And the interesting thing is also that it is not uh, about higher education, but I think it can be interesting for you to know that it exists. It's a pilot project for colleges, so mainly for secondary education. For It's a, it's a, it's, um, a pilot project for cooperation between secondary vocational colleges in Africa and in Europe, uh, and with really exchanges, uh, physical, uh, when possible, of course, exchanges between teachers from Africa and Europe and, and students and pupils as well. But it also uh, involves curriculum development, uh, activities to improve governance of the institutions, etc. So um, this is um, a, a good combination of, 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 the two, of the two aspects. You have here on the slide the details of the two projects that have been selected and of uh, the budget and of the countries involved. And this is quite interesting because it's a pile because, uh, for example, in Erasmus+, Plus, uh, we are not working with Africa on, on vocational education and training, not even on, on uh, higher uh, uh, vocational education and training. And our idea is in the next Erasmus Plus program also to have the opportunity to work on vocational education and training with, with Africa and with the rest of the world. So this, uh, you can see it's, it's a very rich uh, partnership. You, you can see there are uh, many European partners, many uh, African partners covering all the five regions of the African Union uh, in each project. So uh, we are really looking forward to see to see the results. Unfortunately, of course, they have also been stopped uh, as regards the mobility activities by by the COVID-19 virus. But we hope that uh, it will be possible to 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 resume them. And in any case, they will still be able to work in the meantime on the capacity building part of the of the projects. Uh, maybe next slide, please. Yes. Um, yes, this is again Pan-African program. It's an activity funded again by the Pan-African program. And it is about what I call keeping in touch. It's about making sure that the people, the students, the teachers, the administrators that have participated in our mobility uh, activities stay in touch with us, yes, but also among themselves, that they create networks because networks are very, very important uh, for many, many reasons. And this is why uh, we are setting up, actually we have, we have set up uh, uh, an African Students and Alumni Forum which we call ASAF, and you can see here all the, the, um, their addresses. They have an email address, they have uh, social media addresses. A website should be available next month. It's in preparation. And uh, this is um, a kind of platform. It's a very informal platform that gathers uh, African students, graduates, so alumni, uh, university teachers, and uh, university staff members who all have one thing in common. They have participated or are participating in an international mobility experience under mobility schemes supported by the European Union or by the African Union. In practice, meaning Erasmus Plus, 
the uh, intra-Africa uh, academic mobility scheme that I mentioned before, and also the African Union's Nierere Scholarship and Academic Mobility Program. So these are the eligible members for this, uh, for this forum. S uh, we started the forum last year, so more or less one, one year ago. Uh, so far, uh, they have received uh, uh, nearly 3,000 membership requests and s over 1,600 members are already accredited and it's, it's increasing. Um, of course, uh, if you think that our target for this year is to, was to reach 35,000 mobilities between Africa and Europe, uh, I mean, 3,000 members is not not very much. So there is there is still a lot uh, a lot to reach out uh, to 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 many more people uh, in Africa. So this um, this initiative um, stems, in fact, from the Abidjan summit between the African Union and the European Union in 2017, or rather, in the run up to this uh, to this summit, um, there was a there was a meeting, the kind of structured dialogue meeting, uh, with the students and alumni in Africa, and that's where the idea of creating this alumni platform uh, came up, and it was part of a, a formal uh, declaration and a formal call to the African Union and the European Union to support the creation of this platform and this is why uh, the f a certain amount of funds were included in the Pan-African program to, to, to support the creation. And actually, um, the um, so ASAF um, has already uh, carried out a certain number of activities and in particular uh, four regional workshops in 2099 in Africa. Uh, one of them uh, took place in Rabat in Morocco and the others in Ghana, Ethiopia and South Africa. And overall in these regional workshops 29 African countries were represented. And these, the, the goal of these workshops was to better understand what were the expectations of these uh, students and alumni uh, because uh, we want this forum to be useful for them. Uh, so we need really to know what is important for them. And one of the interesting results that came out from these regional uh, workshops was that there is a strong interest for a, a stronger continental, in, continental integration in Africa and also to modernize higher education systems and increase quality standards and also to address uh, the mismatches between the skills provided by higher education and uh, uh, the skills uh, required by the labor market. Um, I think an important feature of this forum is, and I, I would like to repeat it because people tend to forget it, is that this is not an, a, a student's uh, or a graduate association. It also includes academics, teachers, and uh, and and staff. So uh, all these people are involved in, in internationalization. They are involved in education. They are involved in internationalization, and they are all. I mean, we need input from each of them or from each of these three groups because for example administrative staff is also extremely important in internationalization in the implementation of international programs in providing guidance to the students in providing feedback feedback to to the university and to us so uh, it's very very important to uh, connect these uh, these different groups that of course uh, have different expectations and they are also different generations so it's also an intergenerational kind of, of forum so um, yes, um, maybe next slide. Okay, uh, these are just my two final slides. Um, I know you had a, a presentation on Erasmus Plus, so I will not uh, give any details on the program. You probably know uh, everything very well. I just wanted to highlight some figures on participation uh, in, in, in European programs uh, regarding exchanges uh, between Africa and the European Union. I wanted to recall, for example, these uh, Erasmus Plus targets, uh, which are still very much much valid for us. As you see, our target by 2020, you know, we started with 16,000 mobility in 2008. Now we have more than doubled them in, in this year. And this year, uh, we were very well within reach of the 35,000 
before the outbreak of, of the pandemic. So it's really a very, very encouraging uh, development. And also the, the other target of 105,000 mobilities by 2027 that had been set by the previous commission, European Commission, is still very much, much valid for us. Um, simply a, f a few figures on the also on the capacity building projects uh, in Africa funded by Erasmus Plus, 146 projects funded uh, until now, uh, tw 206 projects in the Erasmus Plus capacity building youth because it's not only uh, for higher education. And uh, very interesting also, the, what I call the regional mobility schemes. So the intra-ACP and intra-Africa mobility schemes um, that have been very successful. Of course, the figures are small, 20 projects under the first phase, 25 projects in the, in the, in the current one. Uh, I must say that uh, we have just learned that uh, for the um, the call uh, of, of this well for, of last year um, call for for applications for intra Africa um, the number of applications has doubled since the previous call really doubled and we are now in the process of evaluating the proposals but of course the budget has not doubled the budget is always the same and uh, so. It is very important to show with these figures that there is a very uh, large appetite for this kind of, of exchanges and, and of mobilities and uh, to raise the awareness of, of our uh, uh, leaders uh, to, to not to waste this opportunity uh, to, to, to encourage this enthusiasm, enthusiasm and, and interest that is, there is for, for this kind of, of projects. Okay, uh, next slide. And that is uh, practically my, my final one. It's about the future Erasmus. I suppose you have already heard this, what are, that the future Erasmus will be more international, uh, that it will build on, on past experience. And the interesting thing, it will, uh, I mean, one of the ways in which it will be more international is that we, it will also include vocational education and training for uh, uh, in the partnership between Europe and, and Africa. And this is a very important step because there, there is a very strong demand for support to vocational, uh, vocational education and training. I think that was my last slide. The next one is just uh, to thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I am available for, for questions and clarifications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiorella. Uh, I know how it's difficult to manage uh, a presentation uh, without the slide that you already prepared. And uh, thanks uh, again, because your presentation was perfect. Uh, I, I, I can't ask you to stop your video because uh, the video is in some delay with your voices okay. and you are seeing you that you are talking <laughs> it's a very strange <laughs> uh, but uh, again your presentation was perfect very clear independently by your slide and then of course the slides uh, uh, every time help but the comments that uh, we have in the chat confirm that your presentation was extremely extremely clear uh, I can't ask our, we are still in time to, to, for our session, I can't ask to our uh, attendees if they have any comments or questions uh, or they could write on the chat or eventually they could just ask to have uh, a comment and, they will give, and we will give the, the admission to participate as panelists. Uh, if uh, not in the meantime, I have some uh, uh, questions because, uh, as you know, uh, you mentioned, for instance, in several points that are very interesting for us, for, for, for Unimed Network at least, you mentioned the importance of networks. And uh, uh, you also mentioned the, 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 the virtual exchange in this dimension of... Uh, uh, impossibility to, to travel and to, to do physical mobility, uh, to explore and to, uh, to experiment also with African students and African teachers and African learners 
this virtual exchange opportunity, I think that is an important task. We are working with the, the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange. We had the presentation last week, but generally speaking, as UNIMED, we are part of this consortium that is managing this pilot of European Commission on um, virtual exchange with the Southern Mediterranean countries. Uh, do you think that it could be possible to open the door of these experiences to African uh, uh, students and universities and generally speaking to youth coming from Africa and European uh, uh, youth? Uh, because if, if yes, we have to start immediately to discuss with you how to move uh, on this uh, dimension. Please, the floor is yours for your comment. Yes, yeah, thank you, Marcello. Um, I mean, of course, there is interest in extending the virtual exchanges uh, to, to other countries that just neighboring countries. Um, I, I'm not an expert, I must say, in youth, so uh, uh, my, my, my colleague is, is dealing with the virtual exchanges, but of course I know what they are and I know that I, they are very much appreciated. Um, the, um, the opening to Africa, I mean, it's very much uh, like uh, often with the initiatives uh, that we want to extend a matter of budget, of course, because uh, opening up to a much larger uh, audience uh, would involve uh, uh, different financing needs. So, uh, I mean, this would need to be discussed. Uh, I, I think uh, even for the uh, creation of the current virtual exchanges, there were like feasibility studies uh, to see how would the, you know, the benefits and the costs. And, and, and I suppose that before extending it, uh, there would uh, have to be some kind of analysis of, of evaluation uh, of, uh, of, the, of the needs and would they have the same uh, purpose, the same objectives as with the neighborhood uh, countries. Um, so I, I think, uh, I mean, everything is open. I, I think uh, I know that there is interest also from the countries who are not participating. Uh, um, I know that, for example, because I'm, I'm also involved in works uh, in the framework of the Bologna process, and I know that uh, in the framework of the Global Forum, uh, Bologna Global Forum, there is also an interest for this kind of, of exchanges in general. So I think everything is open. Open, but uh, we would need to build a, a very strong case uh, and, and look at the different aspects and really at what we want to reach uh, and uh, to reach and to reach out how to reach out also because I mean uh, Africa is very big and uh, it's not always easy to to reach out to people I mean I see it with the I mean, now with the alumni uh, the alumni platform uh, it, it, it's quite challenging in many ways for for simply for practical reasons for logistical reasons but I mean everything is open I think we need to to see and and, and evaluate the the, the different aspects and, and define the objectives so exactly why what we want to do it and what do we want to reach. Thank you very much. There is a, a question coming from Alicia Betts from the University of Girona, in particular related to the priorities with the African uh, uh, countries and universities. Mm -hmm. the, she asked if the priority topics are the same that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation uh, because uh, the question is in the chat does the EU yes. have a specific yeah, Africa? Please, please. Yes, 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 I can see the, the question. Thank you for, for this very interesting question. Uh, okay, uh, I would say as a general answer, first of all, the six priorities that I mentioned are the overall priorities for cooperation between the European Commission and the African Union, not only about education. So they really cover all the different policy areas. Of course, in many of these areas, there are uh, there is an education component, I would say most of them, uh, if, for, from climate and environment, so it's not only linked to jobs and, and, uh, and, and growth. So I would say in, in almost all of them, there is an educational dimension, and especially a higher education dimension, uh, research and innovation and, and, and all that. So first thing. Um, 
each of the programs that I have mentioned before, Erasmus+, uh, Intra-Africa, et cetera, each of the programs, because they pursue different policy objectives, because they are linked to different policies, for example, education policy or research policy or uh, development policy, each of these programs have their own priorities, uh, which are linked to uh, the, the, the policy that they serve. Of course, they are very, very similar and they are complementary, but uh, every year or for every call for proposals, uh, the priorities are established for each of these programs. So you will find the priorities for Erasmus Plus for this year uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the call, uh, in the Erasmus Plus call. Um, the um, regarding yes uh, the um, specific countries um, there are okay again it depends for example the neighborhood countries the uh, southern mediterranean countries they are clearly priority countries uh, for partnership with the european union because they have a specific policy dedicated to them to this kind of cooperation uh, we do not have the same for sub-Saharan Africa as, as a whole, as, 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 a, as, a, as a block of, of countries, but it exists for, for, for Southern Mediterranean countries. Uh, another priority, for example, is South Africa, because South Africa is uh, a, what we call a strategic partner of the European Union, uh, like uh, China, or the United States, uh, um, Japan, etc. So uh, there is a special also partnership with South Africa on that basis because they are called a strategic partner. But then uh, for other countries in a way there are uh, maybe less permanent priorities but they can become priority countries depending on their needs and I mentioned before the top up to the Erasmus Plus budget for financing uh, individual mobility, international mobility. And I said that some programs like the Emergency Trust Fund for Africa uh, or the, um, the European Development Fund, they make available additional funds to specific countries. And I, I don't remember exactly, but I think uh, Southern Mediterranean countries, some of them are also priority countries in this context. For example, in, in those related to migration uh, issues. Uh, so there are also these kind of more punctual priorities depending really on the situation of the countries in a particular point in time. So yes, there are priorities. There is a flexibility for the European Union to uh, pick some priority countries to address particular emergencies, I mentioned migration, but it could be uh, something else, uh, or to address uh, other specific issues. So we have like more permanent priorities because the countries are part of a really of a strategy, like the neighborhood strategy, Southern Mediterranean or South Africa, but we also have more, uh, more specific, like short term uh, priorities for other specific countries. Thank you, Fiorella, very, very clear. Uh, uh, obviously, it's very complicated, I can imagine, to manage all these programs looking at all the African countries and so on. Uh, but I would like also to know, um, i give you just an example of, about what we are doing. For instance, we presented yesterday in a very long web webinar uh, a report that we defined about the Libyan higher education system that is called Libya Restart, which was a sort of an overview of the Libyan higher education system through a survey that we conducted with the Libyan universities with the support of the ministry and so on. We have we published a report on that is 90 pages of analysis about the, the Libyan needs and uh, our recommendations to try to answer. All these programs that you mentioned work, work with following uh, call procedures or, for instance, every African government or a joint partnership of African government could address to the European Commission their needs and you try to answer to this. 
Yeah, again, it depends. It depends that we have both. Uh, there are both possibilities. Uh, of course, we have the programs that I have mentioned, most of the programs that I have mentioned before, they use calls for proposals, they are open to everyone, uh, everyone can participate. Uh, they are not bilateral programs, except except for South Africa because, uh, because of this uh, strategic partnerships. But but even South Africa must compete with the others under Erasmus, they, they do not have a privileged status or anything. So. Sure. Um, at the same time, uh, in under the, uh, the, for example, the European Development Fund uh, or the Development Cooperation Instrument, there are uh, possibilities for bilateral cooperation, especially under the, uh, the EDF, the European Development Fund. Uh, but these funds are managed by the EU delegations in the country. So uh, they are not managed centrally. I mean, the, the programs that I mentioned before, they are all managed centrally by the European Commission or by executive agencies. Uh, but the bilateral programs, so really the partnership, the cooperation between the European Union and individual countries are mostly managed by our delegations on site. And that's where Indeed, the, uh, the, the, the support programs are negotiated with the local governments between the EU delegation and the local governments on the basis of their specific needs. Excellent. Thank you very much also for this. Uh, we are perfectly on time. I don't know if there are any other questions or comments from our attendees. Thank you. I think that we can conclude now. Thank you very much, Fiorella, for your very clear and passionate presentation. Uh, you did uh, a great job, uh, and uh, I think that uh, no one uh, had any, any problem looking at all the technological issues because your presentation was really, really very efficient. Uh, thank you very much again. I'm sure Unimed will come back to you. Uh, to know more about and to develop, why not, some common initiative to, again, as I said at the beginning, to improve uh, the capacity of, of our members, both sides, European side and uh, Southern Mediterranean side, to cooperate with our African colleagues. Uh, thank you very much again, Fiorella, for your participation. Uh, thank you, Christina, for your support and for the previous moderation of the other session. Thank you to all the, all the attendees that joined us for these uh, very informative sessions from on Marisco Rosca QV Action and the cooperation with Africa. This afternoon we will have the last uh, webinar of this uh, very intensive Unimed weeks and we will uh, have a webinar jointly with the Union for Mediterranean discussing about employability, which is a common priority for all of us, both sides, European and Southern Mediterranean side. And I thank you again and see you in the coming UNIMED activities. Have a nice lunch break. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye, Fiorella.